Wine Stories, a podcast to discover the world of wine by Etienne Pommier. This story is absolutely legendary in the world of fine wines, and its main character has been at the center of all the discussions for decades. It features the prestigious and near mythical aura of old vintages, magnified by the historical dimension of the bottles at the heart of this extraordinary case. We will meet the world's richest collectors, the most notorious wine merchants and the most prominent wine critics and experts. From an old underground cellar in Paris to Bavarian mansions via the salons of London auction houses, this exceptional story has been told in an amazing book written by American journalist Ben Wallace, The Billionaire's Vinegar published by Random House in 2008, on which today's story is based on. In order to tell you this tale, I have split it in two episodes, and the first one starts in the winter of 1985 in the cozy rooms of a London auction house. Thursday, the 5th of December 1985 in London. A cold winter rain drips on the white façade of a grand Victorian building in the heart of the British capital, only a stone's throw away from Trafalgar Square or Buckingham Palace. We are at number 8 King Street in the headquarters of Christie's, Great Britain's most ancient auction house specialized in sales of art pieces, rare collectibles and fine wines. It is 2.30pm in the rooms of this venerable institution and a man is walking in circles in his office. He is tall and elegant in his tailored suit, his thin metal glasses and his grey-white hair, looking more aristocratic than many British lords. When he's not selling wines or writing tasting notes in his little red notebooks, he likes to draw sketches of landscapes or play Brahms on the piano. Michael Broadbent is 58 years old. He is the founder of Christie's Wine Department and one of the first to hold the prestigious Master of Wine title. For 20 years, he has been searching through the cold and damp cellars of Scottish castles and Britain's oldest mansions to find the bottles that have allowed Christie's to claim the leadership on the fine wine auction market, grossing £7.3 million in sales in 1984. But today, the fine wine expert and auctioneer is nervous. He repeats in his head the lots and paddle numbers, name of the buyers and minimum increments. This is not his first auction by far since he's been selling wines for over 20 years now. But today is special. For buyers, we'll have the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to acquire an absolutely extraordinary bottle like nothing anyone has ever seen. A few months earlier, in April 1985, during renovation works in an underground cellar in Paris, a German collector tells that workers discovered a cache hidden behind a wall apparently erected very long ago. And in this cache, they found a formidable treasure. Two dozens of Bordeaux fine wine bottles. Lafitte, Margot, Ikem, Bran Mouton, the old name of Chateau Mouton Rothschild. But beyond the chateau names, the vintages are what's most amazing about these bottles. 1787 and 1784. Since the 1960s and the 1970s, with the development of the fine wine market in which broadband has been instrumental, it has been rather common to find bottles from the early 20th or late 19th century coming from old family collections in France, in Belgium or in the UK. In its 1973 Christmas catalog, in its 1973 Christmas catalog, French wine merchant Nicolas still features Chateau Margot 1918, Chateau Dickem 1908, and 1900 vintage port. But 200-year-old bottles dating back before the French Revolution is simply incredible. According to the collector, the bottles have probably been hidden to protect them from pillaging and the seller forgotten after its owner's death. There have been so many arbitrary executions during the French Revolution. Sealed in this airtight cache at 12 degrees for two centuries, they have miraculously survived. 
And in order to find out if the wine has survived, the treasure hunter, a German named Hardy Rodenstock, wants to bring one of these bottles to the chateau to taste it with the owner. On May the 3rd, 1985, Count Alexander Lyosalus is hosting a group in his Chateau d'Iquem, and Rodenstock is one of his guests. Halfway through the tasting, he tells the Count that he has brought with him a bottle from 1787 and offers to open it for tasting. Rendered speechless and thrilled by the proposition, the Count eventually agrees and Rodenstock proceeds to open solemnly and with extreme caution the antique bottle. In this instant, time has stopped as everyone in the room bends religiously on one's glass to taste the precious nectar. The color is very dark, amber brown, and the wine obviously very old, but still sweet and rich, and with a special note that both the chateau owner and the cellar master recognize as typical of very old Ikem. In O, in front of this historical wine, the collector and chateau owner agree to meet again in Germany later this year to taste the second vintage found in the Paris cellar, 1784. It eventually happens in October in Wiesbaden in the presence of Michael Broadbent, who is absolutely thrilled by the wine and promptly understands that this would be a career crowning moment for him to sell such a bottle at Christie's. So he convinces Rodenstock to entrust him a bottle of Lafitte 1787 to be offered on auction in December 1985. Since the 17th century, the vineyards of the Medoc and the Grave areas have been producing wines that the English merchants, who are the heart of the Bordeaux wine industry, name clarets. In 1663, Samuel Pepys already mentioned in his journal the wine of O'Brien, better known today as Aubryon, and in 1700, the London Gazette announced the sale of Lafitte, Latour and Margouze. Bordeaux's finest white wine, Chateau d'Iquem, already makes 150,000 bottles, and under the reign of Louis XV, the Duc de Richelieu promotes the wine of Lafitte to make it one of the kingdom's most famous bottles. But the auctioneer's interest goes way beyond the pedigree and vintage of the wine, for all the bottles found in the Parisian trove share a common feature. They are engraved with the chateau name and the vintage, as well as the initials THJ. Broadbent already knows the German collector, renowned connoisseur and hunter of rare bottles, and he trusts him, but he still wants to authenticate the bottle. In order to check the glass and the engraving, Broadbent asks Hugo Fletcher Morley, the glass and porcelain expert at Christie's, who confirms that the bottle is from the 18th century indeed, and that the engraving was performed with a copper wheel typical of the era. Reassured about the quality of the bottle and the engraving, Broadbent then proceeds to show it to an expert from the British Library to verify that the wording, font and style of the characters used is also consistent with known examples from this period. Finally, after having seen the cork of the Ikem 1784 and assessed the cork of the Lafitte 1787, he is fine with it. But what about the initials, THJ? Who can they possibly refer to? Rodenstock has his own ID, and after having looked through some archives, Broadbent grows convinced that the German collector is right. In 1785, Benjamin Franklin, then commissioner in Paris for the newly independent United States of America, is about to step down in favor of a cultivated man and a Francophile, former delegate from Virginia to the Congress of the Confederation and established in France for about a year, Thomas Jefferson, THJ. At that time, Jefferson is already a wine lover who, at the time of building his new mansion in Monticello, Virginia in 1769, started by the wine cellar. Jefferson is an Epicurean but he is also a keen social and political observer of his time. During his stay in France, from 1784 to 1789, he is highly interested in viticulture and winemaking, 
asking plenty of questions with the idea in the back of his mind to one day develop vine growing in the US. For he understands that true independence also requires agricultural self-sufficiency. In 1787, Jefferson travels to Bordeaux where he arrives on May 24th at the Hotel de Richelieu. A few hours and thousands of miles away, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, his peers are gathered for the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Jefferson visits Chateau Aubryon and tastes numerous wines, including many from the year 1784, which he judges to be the best vintage which has happened in nine years. Back in Paris, a few days later, he places a 250 bottle order of Ikem 1784 to the estate and writes to a friend about Bordeaux chateaus. I could assure you that it is from them alone that genuine wine is to be got and not from any merchant whatever. Jefferson asks the chateau to bottle his wines in order to make sure that they are not tampered with by any merchants. And the archives show two other orders placed for 250 bottles of 1784 Lafitte and 252 bottles of 1784 Aubryon. But the negotiator in charge of the shipment messes things up and sends him Chateau Margaux from the same vintage instead. On September 17, 1789, Jefferson invites for dinner at the American Embassy several high-profile guests, including the Marquis de Lafayette and his lawyer friend Governor Morris. In the turmoil of the French capital, only two months after Bastille Day, the guests discuss about the rumors of King Louis XVI fleeing the country when Jefferson announces that he's about to leave for the United States on a six-month sabbatical. He doesn't know it yet, but named the first Secretary of State by President George Washington, he will never see France again, and all his possessions will be sold or sent back to Virginia. Yet several cases of wines ordered in France will never make it to the US. So Michael Broadbent has in his hands a bottle from one of the world's greatest chateaus in an extraordinary vintage that was the property of one of the founding fathers of the United States, author of the Declaration of Independence and third president of the United States. In the Christie's auction catalog, at the page of lot 337, in the column Estimation, he has written Inestimable. The slightly short and round bottle, amber green in color and crusted with old dust, is presented to the buyers before the auction. One can easily read the vintage, Lafitte, spelled the ancient way with two T's, and the famous inscription with Jefferson's initials. The bidding starts at 10,000 pounds. 12,000, 14,000, 16,000, 18,000 pounds. As the price goes up, the number of bidders decreases and the front runner seems to be Kip Forbes, son of billionaire Malcolm Forbes. On the very same day, the American edition Tycoon inaugurates in New York an exhibition in the halls of the Forbes building dedicated to Thomas Jefferson. So, when he heard about the bottle and the auction, he immediately sent his right-hand man and his son to London with instructions to buy it at all costs and bring it back immediately after the sale in private jet just in time for the grand opening. Forbes has little interest in the wine itself and he's convinced, in spite of the high level of the wine still in the bottle's neck, that this is now undrinkable. A few years ago, a 1799 Chateau Lafitte opened in Dallas by collector Marvin Overton was pulled to Baron Elie Rothschild and the chateau owner, visibly unimpressed, only commented after sipping the liquid, it's wine. What Forbes is interested in is the symbolic and historical value of the bottle and knowing that it is now his. Forbes likes to impress his audience and as a die-hard collector, he likes to showcase his trophies. In 1986, during the 100-year celebration of the Statue of Liberty given by France to the United States, he invited the wife of the French president, Daniel Mitterrand, to tour New York Harbor on his yacht. Proud of his collections, he shows her the cellar and his best bottles. Ah, you'll be happy to see all the wines from Bordeaux. 
only to hear the French lady coldly reply, I am from Burgundy. But on this December afternoon, Forbes didn't account for another competitor that will challenge him way beyond expectations. In 1985, Marvin Schonken is the editor of the weekly magazine Wine Spectator, and as a true wine lover, he has come to London to see and try acquiring the unique bottle. But if he can afford to spend a few thousand pounds, he doesn't have the means to compete with billionaires, and it is with a growing frustration that he witnesses the bidding game led by Kip Forbes. The price is now at £50,000, and Schenken cannot take it anymore. He won't let this 35-year-old rich kid who knows nothing about wine and is only here to indulge daddy's latest whim get away with the bottle. Kip Forbes is now at £52,000, when, from the back of the room, Schenken raises his paddle. 54,000, 56,000, 60,000, and the price keeps going up as none of them is willing to let go. Forbes, 78,000, Schenken, 80,000 pounds, and the price keeps rising. I have 100,000 pounds at the back. Hearing Michael Broadbent announced his last bid loudly across the room, Schenken is in shock. He just got divorced and business is tough at the moment so by no means can you afford to spend that kind of money. Carried away by auction fever, he will end up paying for this bottle for the rest of his life. Unless he files for bankruptcy? In any case, he is ruined. When a paddle is raised at the front of the room and he hears the auctioneer announce, £105,000! To his relief, Kip Forbes just outbid him. 105 once, 105 twice, sold for £105,000 to Mr. Forbes. Until then, the most expensive bottle of wine ever auctioned was a 1870 Mouton Rothschild for £38,000 and the oldest, an 1822 Lafitte for £31,000. Jefferson 1787 Lafitte has just beaten all records and becomes for the equivalent of 156,000 US dollars, the world's most expensive bottle of wine. A few minutes later, when he hears how much he has just paid for the bottle, Malcolm Forbes is absolutely furious and he yells at his son over the phone. But soon, an unexpected issue arises, at the time of taking ownership of the trophy. Given the astronomical price of the bottle, an export license will be required. And, as a Christie's employee points out, a certificate from a museum will also be required to confirm that the object is not a national treasure. Eventually, the Victoria and Albert Museum will provide the document, but unfortunately, too late to make it for the grand opening of the New York exhibition. <music> Within hours, news of the record-breaking auction spread all around the world. All the papers talk about the Jefferson bottle and everybody wants to see it. But in the midst of the worldwide enthusiasm around this event, one person doesn't share the general excitement. Lucia Goodwin, who everybody calls Cinder, is a researcher at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation based in the Founding Father's former estate of Monticello, Virginia. Cinder Goodwin knows nothing about Bordeaux fine wines and old vintages, and she has no comment to make on the wine itself. However, she questions the attribution of the bottle and its famous inscription to Thomas Jefferson. On June 14, 1985, after the tasting at Chateau d'Ikem and six months before the sale, Hardy Rodenstock had sent a letter to the Vine Growers Association of Virginia to inform them of the discovery of the bottles in Paris, and the rumor had started to spread. Even before the sale, an article published in the New York Times had also raised questions about Jefferson's ownership of the bottle. Oldest Bordeaux, yes. Jefferson's, maybe. So, in order to be sure, Cinder Goodwin starts searching in the Monticello archives for any documents that could prove or disprove Rodenstock and Christie theory. 
Thomas Jefferson was a hero of meticulousness, and his accounting was duly noted in his memorandum books. Goodwin finds records of the Ikem 1784 and the Margot 1784 purchases, but nothing about Lafitte. Jefferson did write to the chateau in 1788 asking for some 1784, but he received the answer that the vintage was no longer available. She does find another order for Ikem placed from the US in 1790, but only asking for the best vintage for drinking now, and requesting for the wine to be labelled at the chateau, but nothing about any engraving. Since the orders had been placed directly to the chateaus at different times, the engraving should have been performed either in Bordeaux or in Paris at different times too. So why is it that all the bottles shown by Rodenstock seem to have been engraved by the same hand? Besides, engraving hundreds of bottles would have required a long time and involve expenses that do not appear in Jefferson's archives. Cinder Goodwin is also puzzled by the initials. Throughout his life, Jefferson did ask for his initials to be applied on various objects and pieces of furniture, but never with the spelling THJ, and rather TJ. And finally, since Jefferson has left France in the fall of 1789, and that wines at that time were not released on the market until three or four years after harvest, it seems highly unlikely that he could have bought some 1787 vintage or even received it as a gift, which would explain why she cannot find any records for them. For Cinder Goodwin, if there are elements that sustain the theory of the Jefferson bottles in some cases, such as the EKM 1784, she cannot find any for others, such as the Lafitte 1787. Yet, because of the story of the underground cellar and the engraving of the bottles, for her, all the bottles must stand as a group. Either they are all authentic, or they are all inauthentic, as far as Jefferson's ownership is concerned. And she concludes a report asking, Were there not Thomases, Theodores, or Theophiles, who also had a taste for fine Bordeaux wine and would have been resident in Paris in 1790 or after, when the 1787 would have been in bottles? Published a week after the Christie's sale, Goodwin's report infuriates Hardy Rodenstock and Michael Broadbent, who try to challenge it, stating that the researcher doesn't have all the archives and that she cannot jump to such conclusions. Eric de Rothschild does not openly question the authenticity of the bottle, and Candelier Salus confirms that Ikem archives do have the record of a sale of 1784 to Jefferson, with a request for labeling, but no engraving. And other points raise his eyebrows amongst the most skeptical observers. During his stay in Paris, Jefferson used to live on the Champs Elysees, and his former residence has long been destroyed. So, where exactly were the bottles found? Besides, in spite of the worldwide news of the Paris cellar discovery, no French worker has come forth to claim that he was part of the team that found the amazing treasure. In April 1986, the Jefferson exhibition in the Forbes building closes, and the bottle is transferred to another hall. This is where New York wine merchant Bill Sokolin comes to see it, and to his concern, he finds the bottle displayed in a showcase under spotlights. Calling the security guards, he tells them to inform the collection curator, Margaret Kelly, that the Lafitte should rather be placed in a wine-dedicated storage. When she comes to move the bottle after unlocking the showcase, she realizes that something floats on top of the wine, and her face whitens as she looks more closely and realizes that what's floating on the wine is the cork. The world's most valuable bottle of wine has now become vinegar. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Jefferson bottles are still the talk of the town, and Michael Broadbent is rather worried when he arrives in Poyac on June the 3rd, 1986, in front of the doors of Chateau Mouton Rothschild. To put an end to the controversy, Hardy Rodenstock 
has traveled to Bordeaux with some German friends, his private sommelier Ralph Frenzel, and a bottle of Bran Mouton 1787. They meet Philippe Serres de Rothschild, Baron Philippe's grandson, as well as Raoul Blondin, the Chateau Cellar Master, and English wine critic Jensis Robinson. Mouton is mentioned in the Jefferson Notes about his Bordeaux trip, but only as a third tier wine and with no purchase record. Ralph Frenzel starts breaking the wax seal with a miniature hammer and the cork falls into the bottle. The sommelier grabs the filter and is about to start decanting the wine when an alarming noise and a crack in the glass warn the assistants that the bottle is about to break. Frenzel promptly reacts grabbing the decanter and manages to transfer the wine before it is too late. And he starts pouring glasses. The liquid is dark brown in color with an amber rim and so rich for such an old wine that the cellar master is stunned. Philippe Serres de Rothschild brings the glass upstairs to his grandfather, officially feeling unwell. In reality, Baron Philippe, whose wife died in the Ravensbrück concentration camp during the war, has refused to meet the German delegation. After the tasting, Broadbent feels rather relieved as he heads back to the airport to catch the 225 flight to London. The cork looked like the one of the EKM 1784. It fell into the wine like the Forbes bottle, and he believes that the cracking glass rules out the possibility of a more recent engraving. So, while there still are some discussion about the Jefferson's ownership of these wines, as far as is concerned, the bottles are genuine. In 1987, Bordeaux is about to celebrate the 200-year anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's visit. Chateau Aubryon has just installed a plaque in memory of his visit in May 1787, and Christie's has recently announced that they would auction another bottle during the Vinexpo exhibition in spring, a half bottle of Margot 1787, Margot spelled with no X. Reassured by the tasting at Mouton, Broadbent has already sold another bottle of Ikem 1784 in the meantime. The buyer's identity remains uncertain, but some say it could be Dodi al Fayed, son of the Egyptian billionaire owner of Harrods and the Ritz Hotel in Paris, future lover of Princess Diana. The Vinexpo sale is Schenken's second chance after the auction in London in 1985, and he finally acquires the half bottle of Margot for 30,000 US dollars. In order to avoid another Forbes incident with this one, Broadbent asks Chateau Margot if they can recork the wine. General manager Paul Pontalier refuses to handle the bottle, but agrees for the operation to be performed at the estate by Broadbent himself. The Englishman is only slightly surprised to find a longer cork compared to the previous ones. When it's done, he puts the bottle in a sock and packs it safely in a cardboard box placed in his personal luggage and heads to Paris to fly the bottle back to New York. In order not to waste any time or take any chances, Marvit Schenken has agreed to pay for a supersonic Concorde flight and it is Broadbent himself who comes to hand deliver him the bottle in the Wine Spectator offices. But beyond the historical value of the bottle, some rich connoisseurs want to try these famous wines. And in 1988, a tasting titled 200 Years of Chateau Lafitte is hosted in New Orleans by American collector Lloyd Flatt. For the occasion, he has bought one Lafitte 1787 from Rodenstock, who is present at the tasting, as well as Michael Broadbent. During the event, most wines show pretty well, even if some appear to be undrinkable as expected. All the wines too old to be drunk appear very pale in color with faded aromas and tired structures, having lost all their flesh over time. All of them except the Lafitte 1787. This wine is very dark in color and excessively acidic on the palate, but it is clear for all the tasters in the room that this wine is something else altogether. Some hear the words vinegar or salad dressing, and even Lloyd Flat comments, This is the finest balsamic I have ever tasted. 
Once again, Rodenstock and Broadbent defend the wine, but the questions about the Jefferson bottles and the elusive German collector keep coming, and it is just the beginning. For the events about to unfold in the early 1990s will shake the world of fine wines to its core. So that was the first chapter of the incredible story of the Jefferson bottles that have been the subject of all conversations in the world of fine wines and old vintages since their discovery in 1985. And if you want to know how this story ends, stay tuned until next week for the second episode of this saga about the billionaire's vinegar. 